Okay, let the record reflect that Mr. Cummins is now in court. He's represented by uh, Mr. James Simmons, Mr. Paul Bruno, um, and Ms. Tarkenton, uh, states represented by General Malden, and General Whitley, and General Blanton. We're here today to uh, have an evidentiary hearing on a uh, motion to sever offenses filed uh, by the defendant. This is a, a unique case, and it's a unique case to this uh, state because uh, we have uh, three different uh, crime scenes, and in one crime scene we have six separate crime scenes. We have three locations for um, alleged homicides, and uh, I'm going to be uh, referring to uh, these locations um, uh, as the following. Uh, the James Fox F-O-X-X cabin, uh, the Shirley Furley home, and the uh, wholesale trailer. Now, uh, we have uh, here uh, counts one and two involve the James uh, Fox, uh, excuse me, the James Fox Dunham, uh, and we have a theft of a rifle. Counts three, four, and five involve uh, a first degree murder and felony murder during the commission of a theft and theft involving Shirley uh, Furley. And then uh, counts six through 11 are all first degree murder uh, cases um, or, or indictments uh, with different victims. And count 12 is attempted premeditated murder by Ms. Mary Sue Wholesale, H-O-S-A-L-E. And uh, she has uh, given her uh, deposition uh, in this case. Now, the uh, issue is uh, the severance of uh, these offenses, whether they've been mandatorily joined or permissively uh, joined, and whether we have severance, uh, a mandatory joinder or severance of a permissive joinder of the offenses. I thank the attorneys for uh, filing the, the uh, uh, briefs and I can just kind of sum up the positions to be sure that uh, I understand your position going into the evidentiary hearing. Uh, Mr. Cummins uh, is asking for uh, a severance on uh, counts one and two from counts three, four, and five, and uh, then from all the other counts. So is it my understanding that you're asking for a severance involving every particular location? That's correct. It would go from one case to three cases. That's, that's exactly right. That's what I thought. Now, the uh, state has indicated uh, that uh, this is a mandatory join, joinder, or it's not a mandatory joinder. It's a permissive joinder. And uh, the state's argument is that all 12 counts should be joined in one trial. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, now, uh, let me see here. Mr. Uh, Bruno, uh, you, would you like to make an opening statement, sir? You know, I don't think I need to take my motion. If the court wants me to, I would. No, no, but you, you, I, I just don't want to uh, uh, pass up that opportunity. State, have any uh, opening statement you'd like to make? Yes, sir. Go ahead, General. Excuse me, before we start, uh, I know the uh, defendant would like uh, the rule. If there's going to be anybody testifying that might testify at trial, everybody needs to leave the courtroom. Your Honor, uh, we have uh, family members here that won't have anything to do with this motion today uh, that we'd like to ask that they stay in the courtroom and not be barred from testifying at trial because none of their testimony at trial will be at issue here today. Any objection from the defense? Yes.
all the uh, law enforcement personnel will be testifying. Uh, please leave the courtroom. John, yeah, um, we have a case officer uh, who is. Uh, well, this is a motion. Uh, um, I mean, I, 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 do we have three case officers? No, we have one case officer, uh, CBI agent, uh, uh, Gray. Oh, we, 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 have, we have two, uh, Lance. Lance uh, Hampton will be the very first witness. Then we have a case officer uh, on other cases. Position of the defense. My position for today is that there's going to be anyone testifying. I don't, I, I think only one person that's testifying should be here and be in here at a time. And, and I think that's what's generally provided. I don't know if uh, the case law got into the um, particular position where we have um, eight homicides and one attempt homicide, but I'll allow one officer to stay at the table with the state and everybody else uh, must be excluded. Okay, General, I think we're ready for your opening statement. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Your Honor has already observed that the Supreme, uh, that the Summer County uh, Grand Jury has uh, indicted uh, the defendant on 12 counts of the indictment, and that uh, you have already uh, said what those counts are. The state's position is that all of these counts were properly joined in the indictment uh, pursuant to mandatory Georgia rule of Rule 8A of uh, the Rules of Criminal Procedure. And if not mandatory Georgia, certainly the uh, Georgia was correct uh, pursuant to Rule uh, 8B, which is permissive Georgia of the offenses. Because uh, under Rule 8B, uh, it is required that we show, in order to keep them joined, that uh, <clears throat> The offenses constitute parts of a common scheme or plan, or then they are the same or similar character. We have that in this this uh, instance, Your Honor, and you'll see that as evident as we go along in this hearing. Your Honor, we start with the uh, basic premise uh, of the law, and that is the state is entitled to prove its case. Facts come in a lot of different forms and uh, types of facts. And the facts in this case uh, show that all of these cases should be uh, tied together because they're tied up together. It's like the Gordian knot. They're all so interwoven, it's hard uh, and if not impossible to prove one set of facts without proving the other set of facts. We have three crime scenes. Can you put up the uh, first picture? Can you honor see this? Yes, story? I can. Can you see this one, one right here, General? Can you see the one over here, Judge? I hate to tell you which one to look at. Yes, sir, I can. I've got my high-tech uh, corner here, Judge. Okay. I'd like to point out to you. So you. I think you've seen this before, Judge, but we've got two of the wholesale's trailer here at 1177 Charles Lane Road. That's where six people were killed. One was... Uh, victim of an attempted first degree murder according to the state's theory. Now, uh, one mile as a crow flies from Sue Hosell's trailer, uh, that, that we go down to Shirley Curley's residence uh, where Shirley Curley was found uh, dead by lobsters. Going back uh, as a reference point of so Sue Hosell's trailer, We'll go all the way over here to the location of James Fox Dunn's cabin. That's nine-tenths of a mile. From the cabin of James Fox Dunn down to Shirley Curley's residence is 1.6 miles. As you can see, as you honor our three probably knows, this is a very, very rural area, extremely rural area, very few houses but it's all contained in a very small geographic uh, area. If we're to draw a circle around here, you can see how tight it actually is. Uh, now, there's going to be uh, testimony 
about a car that belonged to Shirley Furley here that had been stolen by the defendant, Michael Cummings, and that car was located in this particular area right here. You'll hear that testimony. So everything having to do with this case is in a very small geographic area. Uh, the proof today will show that, uh, to your honor, that it's really not possible to prove the crime of the murder of James Fox Dunn without proving what happened to the six murder victims and Mary Sue Wholesale who survived the attempted murder uh, there at the Wholesale Trail. Likewise, uh, our proof will show, and I think we'll convince your honor, I don't want to presume your thinking at all, but uh, we will prove that uh, the uh, murders in a, a trailer are necessary to show what happened to James Fox Dunn. There's no way to prove James Fox Dunn's a homicide without getting into the facts of the homicide at the trailer there at uh, Charles Brennan Road. Now, in proving the murder of uh, Shirley Furley in the house at 1555, Lugie Brown Road, much of the same evidence in that case relates directly back to the evidence proving the six murders on Charles Brown Road in the wholesale trailer. The facts of all these crimes, Your Honor, uh, will show a common scheme uh, pursuant to Rule 8D. All victims, every single one of these victims, were killed by blunt force trauma to the head. They were all uh, killed, and all the crimes were committed within the same or similar character, within the rule. We have close proximity of time, about 10 days, and location. On April 17th, <coughs> excuse me, on April 17th of 2019, James Fox Dunn's body was found. Uh, his, uh, he'd been there for uh, at least a few days when his body was found. His house had been burned down to the ground. Uh, his head had been uh, severed or removed or separated, I guess is a better word, separated from his body by the time James Fox Dunn was found. And the autopsy showed that he died of blood force trauma to the head. On April 27th, that's uh, 10 days later, that's when the six people were found murdered in the wholesale trailer. All victims, according to the autopsies, show that each one of them died by blood force trauma to the head. The grandmother, Mary Sue Wholesale, uh, survived her uh, attack, but she suffered wounds which were blood force trauma to the head. Sapphire McLaughlin Pitty the little 12-year-old uh, school child that was murdered, uh, found in the, the wholesale home, was found to have uh, tangled, uh, her hair tangled around the metal part of a 30-30 rifle. Uh, the, 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 the metal part of the rifle had been separated from the stock, the wooden part of the rifle. The metal part was tangled up in her hair. Uh, and the butt stock of the rifle, the wooden part, was found elsewhere in the trailer. That rifle, according to the proof, will, will be shown to have been stolen from James Fox Dunn. So James Fox Dunn's murder and murders in the trailer are connected. Also, on April 27th, the discovery of the bodies in the trailer led to the discovery of Shirley Furley's body in her house at 1555 Louie Brown Road. Because the uh, officers developed information that Michael Cummings, the defendant, had been seen driving an automobile that he did not own, didn't have anything uh, connected to him the day before the six murders that, uh, and the registration was run, the license plate was run, and they found out that it belonged to somebody named Shirley Furley. And then upon investigation of, uh, of Mrs. Furley's house, Mrs. Furley's body was found just inside the front door. She was dead. 
Autopsy showed that she died from blunt force trauma to the head. Proof will show that the same or similar tennis shoe imprints in blood were found both in the wholesale trailer and in Ms. Furley's house. A pair of tennis shoes matching those uh, shoe prints in the blood in both locations was found uh, in the wholesale trailer over behind uh, a washing machine or a dryer. It was recovered, they were recovered by the TBI and the defendant's uh, DNA was prominent in those tennis shoes. Ms. Furley's uh, uh, 2017 Kia Forte automobile that had been stolen was found and recovered where I pointed to uh, there with my corner. At trial, the evidence of one crime, Your Honor, is going to have to be admissible to show the elements of the other crimes to show the proof of one to establish the proof of the others. Uh, you can't, and the law is clear, I'm not going to argue the law, but uh, we know that we cannot, uh, the state in any case can't show the evidence of other crimes to prove that the uh, defendant has a likelihood of committing crimes like this, propensity, none of that's going to be an issue here, but we're going to introduce evidence in all three of these crimes to show motive, to show his identity as the perpetrator of all these crimes in the indictment and the common scheme, the common scheme being killed that every one of these victims were killed and attacked by blunt force trauma to the head. So it's clear, that, uh, and it will be clear, I think, to your honor, that the defendant is the one that committed these crimes, and there's no way to untie one crime, one crime scene, and one set of crimes from the other. So that's what the state intends to show this morning. Thank you, General. Uh, uh, just like to make a brief comment here before we hear uh, any testimony. Uh, General uh, Whitley spent most of his time on uh, severance uh, where cases are joined uh, permissibly. Uh, I, I do want to mention that uh, you've got to find a, a common scheme of plan and there are three types. In general, I assume that uh, you are stating that it's part of a larger continuing plan or conspiracy. Um, you also mentioned this, evidence of one of the offenses is relevant to a material issue in the trial of the other offenses. That requires a 404B analysis. And uh, you must show uh, the material issue in the trial that is relevant to the admission of that particular crime. Uh, and in saying that, I don't want us to get mixed up with the elements of a common scheme or plan with the uh, evidence that uh, the offense is relevant to a material issue in the trial of the other offense. Those are distinct. Uh, uh, I need uh, Specificity, motive, intent, guilty knowledge, identity, absence of mistake or plan, or to provide a contextual background stated on the record by the state uh, that would allow this uh, uh, joinder. Uh, that's crucial. And lastly, the probative value of the proof regarding the other crimes is not that weighed by the prejudicial effect of the admission of the evidence. So that is generally. Uh, what I'm going to be looking at, and the attorneys can key in on that. Uh, General, you want to call your first witness. Lance Hampton. Smart and firm testimony going to give this court today to be the truth, the whole truth, don't put the truth, say you I do. Please have a seat, speak very little microphone.
Okay, General. Would you state your full name, please? David Lance Hampton. And uh, you're a resident of Sumner County? Yes, sir. What is your occupation or profession? I'm a detective for the Sumner County Sheriff's Office. How long have you been with the Sheriff's Department? Uh, approximately 27 years. How long have you been a detective? Uh, a little over 20. All right. And as a detective, uh, did you get an occasion to, uh, on April the 17th of 2019, to get a call to go to a fire scene? I did. Would you tell us where you were and what you did? Uh, I was the on-call detective. Um, I was notified by Lieutenant Mike Guthrie that there was a fire across the street from 1260 Ransom Mandrel, Ma Ransom Mandrel Road in Westmoreland. Um, he said that a cabin had exploded. It was reported exploded and it set way off in the wooded area. He said that uh, they had not found the resident of the cabin at this time. Had you ever been to that residence before, Detective Hampton? No, sir. Did you go to that scene? I did. All right. And what did you uh, do when you got there? I arrived on the scene and I went to 1260 Ransom Manual across the street about, uh, it's a few, several hundred yards down the road is a cabin uh, where Mr. J James Dunn lived. Um, Brad Dunn is the brother of Jim Dunn and he was standing in the driveway at 1260 Ransom Mandrel Road. Um, I spoke with him and I said, can you give me a description of your brother? Um, and he described him. And then at that point, I went to the uh, bottom of the hill. It's down a logging road you have to walk down. There were some fire trucks down there, but it's a very rugged area. I went down there. Okay, uh, I interrupted you, but can you just uh, describe to the judge what It's a very rural area. Um, it has a logging road that goes down to it. Um, the cabin has no electricity, no water. There was uh, a smoldering fire when I got to the bottom of the hill. They had extinguished the fire. Um, it's very dark. It's a heavy canopy area uh, of trees. There was, uh, and I noticed there was four vehicles down there that that was an emergency personnel vehicles also. Uh, detective, what time of day or night did you go there? Um, it was around uh, 4 to 5 o'clock in the evening. It, um, I probably didn't get there until a little later than that. It was dark when I arrived. Okay, thank you. Excuse me, General, go ahead. All right. Uh, what about the, you described the specifics of the uh, cabin or where the cabin was located. What about the general area that you were in uh, to go to? You had to walk down a, it's a rough road, uh, heavy brush, briars, uh, the trees, or uh, the canopy, it's just pitch black. You can't see. There's no communication. There's no cell phone. No radios work down there all, either at that time. What was the general area in which uh, all of this was located, like, uh, that you went to? Rural farming community. Many houses? No, sir. Yes, sir. Did you find out any information from Brad Dunn that would assist you in trying to find out what had happened there with the fire? I did. First, I asked the description of his brother, and he described him as a had gray hair. Uh, he already. Material and a L.L. Bean shirt. Um, I asked him, was there any property that he had down there? And he said, well, he had some vehicles down there, one that he drove. Uh, he also said that there was a, uh, I said, well, is there any personal property that we, so we can see if it's down there? He said that there was a, a rifle that his brother had purchased several years ago. Uh, he described it as a lever action rifle, and that was the only information he was able to provide at that time. Um, he said there were some chainsaws and just some other, uh, he said his brother always had a hatchet with him. Um, 
but that was about it. Other than that, the clothing and description was it. Did you learn whether or not uh, Mr. Dunn uh, lived by himself or with somebody? He lived by himself and had for several years. All right. Uh, did you learn anything about uh, James Fox Dunn's uh, lifestyle? Um, um, he lived, uh, it was described to me as he lived off the grid. Um, he didn't, he didn't want to be. Um, his brother would provide him with, um, had a post office box in Westmoreland that he would make sure that he got, got, was able to go, provide him money. Um, and his brother would go in and or anybody around him just wanted to be by himself with his dog and his chickens. Arm, this, uh, what, if anything, did you do to try to locate Mr. Uh, James Dunn? Um, once we were determined that, the fire, that he was not in the cabin where the, after the fire was extinguished, uh, we started a search of the area. Um, I notified all the personnel down there that we needed to start doing a search for him. Um, Detective Brandon Clark and I walked, it would be to the east side of the cabin, probably about 65 to 75 yards. Um, Detective Clark said, wait just a second, I see something, and it was a briar thicket. Um, it's like a, it's a very heavy area with briars in it, but we know we observed a body there. It was on its back with its feet facing away from, uh, away from us, shoulders towards us, and it was missing a head. How far uh, away from the cabin was, uh, what he found as far as the body is concerned? Probably no more than 75 yards. All right. And was it still dark when you found the body? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, you said that uh, the body was uh, missing the head. Yes, sir. What did you do when you saw the body? Um, at that point, when we realized that we were missing the head, I notified, again, the personnel there and uh, detective, I'm sorry, Deputy Miranda Vaughn. She was about 20 yards from the body and found the head there. Could you tell uh, whether the body uh, Mr. Dunn had been there for a while or was it there just for a recent uh, period of time? It had appeared he had been there for a few days. All right. And so you discovered the body and the head? Yes, sir. Uh, what did you do uh, after you found that? Um, notified the district attorney's office. Uh, to, let them, to let them know what was going on and then an autopsy was ordered. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And did you have an occasion to attend any part of the autopsy that was done on James Dunn? I did. And you have seen the autopsy report? Yes, sir. What was the result of the cause of death at the autopsy? It was blunt force and sharp force trauma. To the head. Your Honor, I have a copy of the autopsy report on James Fox Land Jr. that I would like to make an exhibit. We'll make that autopsy report on number one. And for the record, parts of that report were furnished in the response from the state. And Ms. Resnick, I'm going to order that all exhibits be placed under seal. All right, General. There uh, at the scene, did you have any idea uh, who had, uh, or, or how, were, you, were you able to solve it or find out why Mr. Dunn was, was dead? No, sir. Not at that time. All right. What else did you do uh, there at the scene? Uh, at, uh, that particular night, um, we, after the medical examiner's office picked up Mr. Dunn, we left the we left the scene. Um, did you ever have occasion to return uh, back to the scene? Yes, sir. We did. When was that? And why did you return? Um, we were notified. We returned a couple of weeks later. It was after April the twenty seventh. Um, I don't have the exact date in front of me, but I know that it was after April the 27th. Um, 
We returned, I was notified that there was a rifle that was recovered at the Cummings residence at, right. uh, on Charles Brown Road. And I... Right. The, the rifle was recovered from where? Charles Brown Road, 1177 Charles Brown Road. Right. That's the wholesale trailer? Yes, sir. All right. Um, I was notified that there was a rifle recovered there. I spoke with uh, Special Agent Russ Winkler, and I told him, I said, that I was missing a rifle from James Dunn's residence, and I described what his brother had described to me, Brad, as a lever action rifle, and Special Agent Winkler told me that there was a rifle that was a lever action rifle that was recovered at the scene, but he didn't have any of the information, but he would provide that to me as soon as he could. Okay. Uh, of course, the rifle was not found when you were out at the scene on the 17th, right? That's correct. Was anything of value that, that, were, that was found? On the secondary search, yes, sir. I'm talking about the first search. Uh, on the first search, we didn't find anything other than Mr. Dunn. All right. So what was the purpose of your doing a secondary search? Once I was notified about the rifle at the Charles Brown address, I felt that this, both of these cases were connected, and I w we d went back and did a secondary search looking for shell casings, spent shell casings to the, that would match up to the rifle that was recovered at the Charles Brown house. Find any such shell casings? Found one shell casing inside the van in the cup holder. And what uh, do you know now what kind of shell casing it was? It was a 3030 shell casing. Where did you say you found it? In the cup holder of the van uh, that was on the property. So it was a van on the property? Yes, okay. sir. Thank you. You mentioned uh, earlier uh, that there were four vehicles when you, uh, there at the scene when you arrived on the 27th, I mean the 17th. Yes, sir. Could you go into a little bit more detail about those vehicles? Um, there was one vehicle that Mr. Dunn actually drove. Um, the other vehicles, were, there were things stored in it, such as firewood. There was tools. Uh, on a particular night that we were there, um, there was a dog and chickens inside the van. It was cool that night, or had been cool, and uh, they were inside the van when we looked in it. Yes, sir. Would you tell us why you did that? Um, I was uh, notified by Major Tim Bailey that there was a, a residence on, on Charles Brown Road that uh, patrol had responded to, and there was multiple bodies inside the residence. So I responded there. What did you see when you got there? Uh, when I first got there, uh, I saw the trailer. Uh, there was Deputy Mike Ida Rest that was standing out in front of the trailer. Um, I uh, immediately went to him to find out. Uh, Deputy, who, I'm sorry. Michael Adaresta. I D A R E S T A. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I went to him to find out what was going on, what he had found. He was the first responding officer. He said that he had gone into, the, uh, he responded to the house, um, went inside, observed. Uh, a body under the couch. He observed bodies, a body on the couch. There was a body in the uh, room to the right facing the trailer, a room to the right. Um, and there was another body down the hall. Uh, he said there was also a female inside the residence that was uh, still alive at the time, um, and she was life flighted to the uh, to skyline. Okay. So did you go inside the trailer yourself? No, sir. I did. Um, the residence was secured uh, when after uh, med after a ten medical attention had been taken on all the people and they had been pronounced dead. Uh, Tim Bailey informed us that TBI. Who is Tim Bailey for the record? He is the major over criminal investigations for the sheriff's office. Uh, he informed us that uh, he had contacted the district attorney's office and TBI was going to come and take over the investigation. The residence was secured. Uh, I stepped away from the drive. I stepped across the street. There was three people standing there. I spoke with them, began interviewing them. Um, during that time, uh, Jim Scarborough with TBI came and he took over the interview process with those three people. 
Um, while standing there, um, I received, uh, there was information over the radio that there was a black Kia vehicle that was Michael Cummins was driving earlier, and they had located that vehicle in the creek bed at Charles Brown and Keene Hollow Road. Um, I asked for the registration of the vehicle. Um, they gave me the address of 1555 Luby Brown Road. Uh, immediately, Chris Tarlacky, who is a lieutenant with the sheriff's office, and I got into his car, drove to 1555 Luby Brown Road. Can you identify that picture? Yes, sir. That's 1177 Charles Brown Road. That's the wholesale trailer. Okay. I'd like to make that the next exhibit. Can you see the number two camera? Where is that? Can you check me over here? All right. You learned about the, uh, the Kia that uh, Michael Cummins was driving, or had been driving. Yes, sir. Uh, as for the registration, uh, the address that it came back to, um, and it came back to 1555 Luby Brown Road. Did it have a person's name? It was Shirley Furley, but at the time, I don't remember if it came out over the radio or not, or if that was determined at a, after I got to the address. Okay. And who went to the, uh, the uh, address of 1555 Luby Brown Road? Uh, Lieutenant Chris Tarlake with the Sheriff's Office and I went there and Detective Brandon Clark with the Sheriff's Office met us at the residence. Got another picture I want to show to you. Can you identify this picture? Yes, yeah, so that's 1555 Luby Brown Road. That's uh, Shirley Farley's residence. And that's where you and Detective uh, or Officer Tarlick are at. Yes, sir. Exhibit number three. What did you do when you got there? I uh, did a perimeter search of the residence, located an unlocked door on the left door of the residence. Uh, it was unlocked. Did you knock on the door? Uh, we did knock, and there was no answer. Uh, that door was unlocked, but we moved to the front door, knocked and announced, and realized that the front door was unlocked there. We made entry into the residence at that point. Who, who made entry into the residence? Uh, myself, Lieutenant Tarlacki, and Detective Clark. And what did you see when you got inside the residence? Um, approximately three feet from the front door, uh, observed a female lying on her back with her arm twisted around uh, with uh, trauma to the head. Was she dead? Yes, sir. All right. And what did you do when you saw her? Um, Chris Tarlacki stayed with her, and I moved. Brandon Clark and I secured the rest of the residence. Uh, then we came back into the residence to exit, and so I could notify command that we had found another uh, person and needed the medical examiner to come there. And, and what day was this? That was on April the 27th. Okay. Could you tell uh, how long Ms. Furley had been there in general terms? I couldn't tell how long she'd been there, no, sir. All right. Was it, uh, she'd been there a long time? Uh, she'd been, it, it was apparent that she had been there for a few days, but our a couple of days anyways, but I couldn't, but I don't know exactly how long she's been there. What did you do uh, with the, the scene uh, there at Ms. Furley's house where, where Ms. Furley's body had been located? Um, after... So once we know, once that we notified command that she was uh, deceased and we needed the medical examiner, we waited for the medical examiner to come. They pronounced her, and then at that point we stepped out of the scene and secured it and waited for TBI to arrive on the scene because they were taking over that investigation also. So you 
turn that scene over to the PBI. I did, but as walking out the door, I did go. Um, I still wasn't sure who the female was in the residence at the, at the time. I knew that. So I went to the mailbox to see, to verify. I pulled a piece of mail out and saw that the name was Shirley Furley on the mail. Um, I used the criminal justice portal, which is the driver's license portal, uh, and pulled up her name and was able to verify that the photo, indeed, on the on driver's license was the same person that was inside the residence. Now, uh, you said that the Mike Sancho, yes, sir. All right. When did you speak with him and why? It was after the 27th, April the 27th. Um, I was speaking with the neighbors to see if they had seen anything in the area. Uh, and he said that um, on the Friday, which I would have been April the 26th, uh, he said that he saw Michael Cummings walking up the street carrying a rifle. He said he was walking uh, towards uh, Keene Hollow on Charles Brown Road. Did you ever speak with any witnesses that uh, uh, said that they'd seen anyone driving in this Furley's vehicle? Uh, I did. Um, Brian Cummins. And Sh uh, Brian? Uh, he was one of the three people that I interviewed that was standing in the drive across from 1177 Charles Brown Road uh, after I exited the residence. He was one of the three people that were standing there. All right. What did he say? Uh, he said that there had been, that uh, Michael had been driving a black car, a uh, black Kia, uh, earlier. And that, that's all he said about the car. Did you speak to anybody else that, that there, there was Sherry Robinson and Dwayne Robinson were standing there during the conversation. Uh, it was Brian Cummings that said that he was the one driving the vehicle, though. Do you know whether or not the, the black kid was ever recovered? Yes, sir. And where was it recovered? It was recovered in the creek bed at Charles Brown and Keene Hollow Road. Approximately, I, I'll say it was probably 100 yards from the bridge. There's an area that you can drive down into the creek. Yes, sir. It's an overhead picture. Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, Shirley Furley's residence is, is here. Do you agree with that? Yes, sir. All right. And uh, location of James Dunn's cabin is up here. That's correct. Do you agree with that? Can you tell us where the uh, car is located? Um, where James Dunn's residence is, you said uh, where the top of the triangle is. Right. If you come down just a little, it's right in that general vicinity right there um, in the creek. All right. So the, the, where is the creek? You're, uh, you're on the creek there, and, it's, and it circles around all the way around to James Dunn's house. It's S A N S C H O, I believe, sir. Okay, thank you. Just doing that for the record. <clears throat> Okay. 
Okay, General. This is the photograph that was given to me by Brad Dunn, James Dunn's brother, of what the cabin looked like when he had been there weeks prior to it. it was James Dunn's cabin. Yes, sir. Exhibit number five. sheriff's office and the fire that's correct okay and the sheriff's office uh, took over immediately started the investigation with related to the fire and then related to mr. Dunn is that correct yes sir okay and it's my understanding that the sheriff's office has maintained uh, has been the lead agency for lack of a better word in investigating that homicide mr. Dunn yes sir okay that the TBI has not taken over that homicide that's correct with regard to uh, the wholesale residents, um, what, do you know who responded initially? What, what law enforcement agency responded initially to that scene? That was the sheriff's office. Same, same office as your office? Yes, sir. Okay. But in that particular instance, the TBI did take over that investigation. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And would they be considered to be the lead agency investigating those homicides in the wholesale trailer? Yes, sir. And then with the Furley residents, and it's my understanding that again, the sheriff's office and specifically you would have been the first law enforcement agency, for lack of a better word, to respond to that scene. So yes, sir. Okay. And, uh, and then for some reason, the TBI has taken over that investigation as well. Yes, sir. And they're the lead agency on that. Yes, sir. But they've left the Dunn investigation separate and, and left that under the, sheriff, the Sumner County Sheriff's Office jurisdiction. Yes, sir. Regarding um, what I would call the fire, um, I think you said somebody might have referred to it as an explosion, whatever happened at that cabin. Um, in, the, in the two years since that occurred, have, has anybody been able to determine what caused the fire? No, sir, it was undetermined. Okay, so we don't know if it was accidental, if it was arson, if there was an explosion, where nobody really knows how the cabin caught on fire. That's correct. Okay. And then I guess, therefore, no one knows who, if it were accidental, no one caused it, but if somebody caused it, no one has any idea who caused that fire. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And you said that there was, there were four vehicles there, um, and I guess at least one of them was operational. That's correct. Okay. Um, so this is April 17th, 2019, when the fire occurs, and that's the same evening that you discover his, Mr. Dunn's body, correct? Yes, sir. And, and there's been mention, but it appears that his uh, body was, um, had been decomposing for some period of time, is that correct? Yes, sir. And your estimate is a few days before, but... It was a few days. The temperature ranged from like 37 to 80 degrees, 78 degrees during that that three to four day period. Okay, and we may have some expert testimony down the road, but my point is, is it appears he was not um, killed on April 17th. It appears that it would have been at least days before that that would have occurred. That's correct. Okay. You, you the mentioned, we had mentioned that, um, or it had been mentioned um, that the head had Mr. Dunn's head had been separated from his body. 
at least they were found in two different locations, correct? That's correct. And you attended the autopsy? I did. Okay. And based on attending the autopsy and what you've heard uh, with your investigation since then, um, do you know whether or not anyone's given an opinion that the head could have been separated due to animal activity? It was discussed. Uh, it was discussed amongst, amongst investigators while we were there that night uh, and through Dr. Um, Dr. Behrman at the Emmy's office. All right, when you say it was discussed, has anybody come to a conclusion as to how the head was separated from the body? No, sir. Could it have been animal activity? It could have been. Regarding the, um, I'll just, I'll call it Mr. Dunn's, his gun, the rifle that was found? Yes, sir. Um, do you have any evidence as to when that rifle was removed from his cabin area or how, or when it was taken from him? No, sir. Do you have any evidence as to whether or not it was actually taken from him as opposed to being sold by him? No, sir. Okay. And do you have any evidence of who may have either purchased it from him or who may have taken it from him or taken it from his cabin. Do you have any evidence as far as who took the rifle? No, sir. My understanding is that that rifle has been examined by the TBI lab. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And was there any evidence, um, in the, in the, any forensic evidence that connects that rifle to Mr. Cummins? Uh, I can't speak to that. Um, okay. okay. Um, you mentioned a, a Mr. Sancho. Uh, if I, I, I think that's how you that's say it. That's correct. Um, that he had told you that he had seen Michael Cummins with a rifle a, a few days before you arrived at the Curley residence. Or tell me specifically. I think he said on Friday. I would have to see the report, but I think it was on Friday. Okay. And did he say? Um, I think, Trying to figure out where was he when he said he saw Mr. Cummins with the rifle. So he lived at 11, well, he lived about three houses down from 1177 Charles Brown Road in the curve. Okay. Uh, and he said he, he was driving back and he saw Michael Cummings walking down the road carrying a rifle, walking towards Keen Hollow on Charles Brown Road. Okay. So, so the, the Charles Brown Road, can we put that map back up on the... Yes, sir. May I walk over towards the... Yes, sir. I'm trying to figure out where he lived and where he says he saw Michael Cummins with the rifle. So, my understanding is this is kind of Charles Brown Road. Yes, sir. Okay. And did he live closer to the Dunn residence or further away? He lived um, from the wholesale. If you look to your right, he lived. There's a curve uh, down the, just a little from there, back this way. Coming back this way. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, he was driving from the other side, from which is Keen Hollow side, uh, where the Dunn house is on that side. Okay. He was driving up that road and saw him walking between the wholesale residence and the Dunn residence. There's actually a residence at the bottom of the hill there, a trailer, and that, he was walking between that and the wholesale residence. Okay. And that trailer, is that the trailer residence where the Robinson lives? Yes, sir. Okay. So, I'm, I'm, so basically, he's driving down the road. He's driving back towards home, yes, sir. That's correct. That That's correct. Okay. And so he, did he stop at any point, do you know, or did he just drive by and have to He said he just kept on going. Okay. Did he give any description, specific description of the rifle? Um, he said he believed it was a dark color rifle, but that's all he could remember about it. Okay. He didn't know whether it was anything else. Okay. 
So, kind of going to that property we were talking about, you mentioned the trailer at the end of that road. Um, the, the Kia was found um, near Charles Brown Road and King Hollow Road. Is that correct? In the creek? Yes, sir. Okay. That property, is that where um, Brian Cummins and Sherry Robinson and Dwayne Robinson live? Uh, they live on the property before you get to uh, before you get to the bridge. That's where, the, in the corner of that uh, Charles Brown Road, that's where they live. In the corner of Charles Brown and King Hollow. That's correct. Okay, and is that where the creek is? There is a bridge there, yes, sir. Okay, and I'm asking you, is that where the Kia was found in that creek? It was found. Um, it would be on the right side of the bridge towards the Dunn residence okay. in the creek. Cross the road. Yes, sir. Cross the road in the, in the, by, by the same creek. Yes, sir. Okay. And Brian Cummins, so in, and so where Mr. Michael Cummins was walking and then real close to where that Kia was found, the three people that lived there on that property are Brian Cummins, Sherry Robinson, and Dwayne Robinson, correct? Yes, sir. What is Brian Cummins? Relation to the to the um, uh, we'll say the wholesales that, that were in the, the wholesale cabin is he related? To I think that? he was a son, or he was a cousin. I'm I'm not sure what his relationship. Okay. But he's a blood relation of some sort. He is he's blood related. Those victims in that cabin. Yes. In, excuse me, in that trailer. Yes. Is Miss Robinson? Is she related to uh, anyone in that wholesale? Yes. And, and you know how she's related? I think she's a daughter. Okay. And. Dwayne Robinson, is he also that's a, a blood relative? That's Sherry's son. son. Okay. Anything else, sir? No, Okay, I've got a couple of questions for Mr. Hampton. Uh, you testified about the cabin, and the cabin exploded, and that the cause was undetermined. Uh, was anybody able to determine uh, when the fire started, or when, when, when anything started there? No, sir. Uh, when I arrived, it, it had already, they had, the fire department had put it out. It was burning that night is when it, the fire did start. Okay. Uh, you said that you attended the uh, autopsy of uh, uh, Mr. Dunn. Was the medical examiner ever able to uh, determine or estimate the time of death? Uh, no, sir. You said that uh, the, uh, there were four vehicles on the scene and the, uh, Mr. Dunn drove one of them. Which vehicle was that? Uh, it was a truck that he drove. Okay, so it was a different vehicle uh, than what the shell was found in? The shell casing was found inside of a customized van. Okay. That was the vehicle that it appeared that it had all of his belongings inside of. Okay. Uh, let me ask you about Mike Sancho. Is he alive and able to testify? Yes, sir. What about Brian Cummins? Is he alive and able to testify? Yes, sir. What about uh, Sherry and Dwayne Robinson and Brian Cummins? Are they alive and able to testify? Yes, sir. Okay. I don't believe that's all the questions I have. Nothing further here. 
Okay. Uh, uh, detective, you may step down. Let's take about a 10 minute recess and then we'll resume. Everybody may be excused. All right. This court's in recess.